A young girl murdered, a wrongful conviction, and decades worth of waiting to finally get to the truth. Hello, true crimeers. This is the case of Christine Jessup. Viewer discretion is advised. Real quick before we get started, of course, hello, my name is Mike. If you're new to the channel, I tell three true crime stories every week here on YouTube, Mondays, Wednesdays, and Fridays. I also tell short form true crime stories where I'm more known over on TikTok. I tell at least one or two stories there every single day. The link to that is in the link tree in the description of this video below. It also comes up here at some point in the beginning and at the end of the video. So feel free to follow there if you like. But please subscribe here too if you're into true crime of course otherwise don't <laughs> also in the link tree below you will find the link to my merch store we sell t-shirts and hoodies and stuff like that we do ship to every place on this planet is a weird way to say it but it is what it is lastly if there is a case you want me to cover just email me my email is also listed below or it's mikey at truecrimeer.com just email me the name of the individual, where it happened, when it happened, that's all I really know, need to have, and then I will add the name to my list. I choose the cases I cover at random, so I cannot tell you when I'll cover that case, but I will cover it eventually. You can actually see the list to see if the name's on there already or not um, in the, the, the link tree in the description below. But let's get into today's case, shall we? Not like that, okay. Christine Marion Jessup was born on November 29th, 1974, and she was born in the little town of Queensville, which is in Ontario, Canada. Or it was a little town, at least back then. I guess Queensville really consisted of like a handful of houses, a general store, and a park, and then like a nearby school back in 1974 when she was born. This is one of those communities that Everybody knew everybody. Everybody, everybody knows your name. Do, 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 do. No, don't do that. Okay. But like, you could walk down the street and say, hey, Fred. And they're like, hey, Cheryl. You know, like everyone just knew each other. Therefore, there really wasn't any strangers in the community. Everyone just kind of was, felt trusted with one another. Fast forwarding to 1984, when this case takes place, it's pretty much the exact same scenario. You know, parents back then would just say, hey kids, go outside and play and don't come back until the street lights come on kind of thing. And the kids would, you know, they would play all afternoon after school, then they would come home for dinner. And, you know, parents didn't need to be outside keeping a watchful eye on the kids 24-7. It was just seemingly a safer time. But the reality is, is it really wasn't. By the time Christine Jessup was nine years old, she was considered a kind of like a mix of a, you know, a tomboy, but also a girl's girl, you know. She would love to watch and play baseball with her older brother, but then she would also flip and play with her dolls. She had a, a little pet, I guess, frog in their basement that she would take very good care of. And she had a dog that she loved, a beagle named Freckles. They were two of them were like thick as thieves. Her frog, by the way, was named Harold, of course. <laughs> she was, you know, like I said, an adventurer, an explorer. She would love to be outside. And I guess there was like this cemetery behind their neighborhood or their house. And she would kind of frequently play in that area. But then there was also a park across the street from the general store, which was just down the, down the road, that she would also play at with her friends. She was a very uh, affectionate and emotional young girl, it seems like, especially when it came to animals. There's a story I read that, I guess one night, there were, she saw some baby chicks outside her house, and so she didn't want them to be alone, and so she curled up next to them outside and slept with them uh, so that they wouldn't be alone. <laughs> You know, she was just someone who was just full of excitement, full of life, a lot of pep in her step, and she was just a kid, and she loved being a kid. It was October 3rd, 1984. Janet Jessup, Christine's mom, had been in Toronto that day. Christine had got out of school that afternoon, and there would be like a 20-minute, like, little window of time between when Janet would arrive home and when Christine arrived home. So basically for 20 minutes, Christine would be home alone which 
back then, you know, just considering the neighborhood, considering the environment, considering the times, it was like, okay, it's 20 minutes. It's not a big deal. According to classmates, Christine was super excited that day. She was happy. I guess she was in music class and she was given a recorder by her music teacher and she was like so excited to come home and show it to her, you know, to her mom and her brother. Her dad uh, was not going to be home because her dad was actually serving an 18 month prison stint, I guess for some kind of financial related crime with the family, I'm not 100% sure. But when Christine would have gotten home, her mom and her brother would not be there yet. So she, there was this little change jar they had in the house and Christine had sorted through it. She took out a nickel and then she was gonna go run down to the general store. And her goal was just to go buy a piece of gum. And then she was supposed to meet her friend Leslie at about 4 p.m. at the park, which was across the street from the general store. Leslie got to the park at about 4 p.m. and she waited for her friend Christine. Then she waited. Then she waited some more. Then she kept waiting, 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 waiting. Christine never shows up. Now, just to be clear, there were witnesses who could say with absolute certainty that Christine Jessup was on that bus that day. She got off the bus. And so there was only a very small window of time when, you know, something could have happened to her if something happened to her. At 4.10 p.m. is when Janet and Kenny arrive home. When they got there, they noticed that Christine's uh, signature bicycle was lying on its side and the kickstand had been like, I guess, broken. And this was, I guess, near or inside the shed. Janet also made note that when they walked in the house, Christine's jacket was on the coat rack, but it was at the highest position, a position that nine-year-old Christine couldn't reach. Her backpack was there in the kitchen, so they knew that she had gotten inside the house, and the mail and the newspaper were also brought in. So they also knew that Christine, because she always did that, she brought all that in. By 5 p.m., Christine is nowhere to be seen. You know, her mom has been searching now for her for the past 40, 50 minutes or so, and to no avail. Janet will walk through the cemetery behind the house, calling out Janet's name. She walks to the general store. She walks to the park looking for her. Nothing. She then calls the home of her friend, Leslie. Leslie answers and says, yeah, Christine didn't show up to the park when she was supposed to. Janet was, you know, despite the comfort level that people tend to have back, back then, at least with like kids going outside and playing, Janet was the type of mom who kept a pretty, she reined in her kids pretty well. Like she was pretty much always on top of them. She never, she rarely ever would leave them alone for any amount of time. That 20 minute window of time, you know, on this particular day was just, that's just the way it happened. She was always very watchful of them and she always kept, you know, a very close eye on them. She was a really, really good mom, but you know, you can't possibly keep your eyes on them literally every moment of the day. When the sun went down that night, Janet called the York Regional Police to report her daughter missing. You know, typically when kids go missing, at least back then, it was like, eh, either the kids just ran away and they'll be home soon, which usually happened. But that was not the case this time. Or sometimes the parents, like, usually there's like, you know, parents who are separated and maybe the dad will like end up kidnapping one of the children and taking them somewhere. But they knew that didn't happen here because, you know, Christine's dad was in prison. And Janet, they could account for where Janet was the entire time. This was a very new scenario for the, the York police, I guess. They had a very tiny police force back then. They didn't really deal with like missing people that often. They didn't deal with murders like ever. And I guess the experience or the lack thereof was, it, it would end up, you know, it essentially would hinder the case. So like when the investigators came to the house, they they did a, such a shitty job. They, without wearing gloves, they would basically handle Christine's jacket to look at it, right? And they didn't collect any evidence off of it. They noticed that the plastic was still on the newspaper, that plastic sleeve. They handled it without gloves and they never dusted it for fingerprints. There were, you know, family and friends and neighbors who were allowed to come in and out of the house after police got there, just trampling everywhere, touching things. And it, you know, completely destroyed the crime scene and any evidence they could have gotten from it was just gone. 
They would set up a, a command post, I guess, at the nearby fire station. They would have primarily the residents of the of this town because, again, the police force wasn't that big. And so they would primarily consist of family, friends, and volunteers searching every single place they could think of. Um, they are searching all of the wooded areas. They are combing through every bush, looking under every tree. They are digging, you know, in certain places. They're looking in any bodies of water that may be nearby. They are searching high and low for Christine Jessup. Despite all of this searching they do at first, there is, there's no, there's nothing. They don't find any trace of her. Bob Jessup, who is Christine's dad, who, like I said, was in prison, was actually allowed to be released, I guess, on humanitarian grounds because his daughter was missing. And that way he and his wife could go on the news and they could talk, talk about what's going on and he could also help in the search. This is one of those situations where, you know, even though they're inexperienced, the police do know that if this was an abduction, there is a strong possibility it was done by someone that Christine probably already knew, maybe. That was their guess at least. And one person that came up almost immediately was a guy named Calvin Hoover. He was, a, I guess, a friend of Bob's. Calvin was married to a woman named Heather, and I guess police would also interview Heather to see like what her whereabouts were that day. Heather said she was at work all day long into the time that she would have been, you know, Christine would have gone missing, which police confirmed. And all she could say was that she just uh, could assume her husband was at work as well. Unbelievably, these inexperienced police officers would not interview Calvin Hoover. They never interviewed him at that time. Calvin Hoover at that time was a 28-year-old tradesman. He was a drinker, a partier, and he was addicted to gambling. Many people in his life would describe him as being incredibly selfish, very self-centered. And he could be very vindictive and very mean-spirited at times. But eventually, Calvin Hoover would, you know, become friends with, with uh, Bob Jessup. Then the Jessups and the Hoovers became friends. They would do barbecues together, you know, have parties together. They were close. Apparently on October 1st, 1984, just a few days before Christine disappeared, Janet would take Christine and Kenny over to the Hoover's house, which I guess they lived about 50 kilometers away. While they were at the house, in earshot of Calvin, Janet would tell Heather Hoover, I'm gonna go visit Bob in prison, and, you know, I'm probably going to leave Christine, I'll let Christine just stay at the house after school for, you know, for a few minutes, just given the time frame when she was expected back home. Because, you know, this wasn't like an environment for, you know, Christine to be in, you know, like in a prison. And like I said, Calvin was there and he overheard all this. So he knew that Christine was going to be alone for a period of time that day. But again, police wouldn't really know most of this until a long time later. Um, because like I said, Calvin Hoover was never questioned by police back then. Now we're days later after Christine has disappeared, they have continued to search for her. They're searching on foot, they're searching by vehicle. They are looking everywhere for her and they come up with nothing. Days go by, weeks go by, months go by. And then December 31st, 1984. In, I guess, a hamlet called Sunderland, about 56 kilometers away from where Christine lived. There was a gentleman with his two daughters who, I guess, were out looking for their dog on this big, large, open property. There was this long, kind of dirt, desolate road. And as they were walking down it, this trail, they noticed this, like, pile of what looked like garbage from a distance. They approached that pile of garbage and they realized that isn't garbage. It's a body. It is a decomposed body of a very small person. Even he could tell, this guy looking, that there were just, there were stab wounds in this, this little girl's body. So he calls police and police get to the scene as soon as possible. They do confirm that she was, this girl was stabbed numerous times. The body was dressed in a, in a turtleneck with a blue pullover and a blouse with some missing buttons. Next to the body was a pair of little girl's underwear. And then a few feet away in the grass was a recorder. And on that recorder was the name written Christine Jessup. And very soon afterwards, they confirmed that this was in fact the body of nine-year-old Christine Jessup. 
I guess in the community, people were like, wow, why was she found so far away, you know, from her home? You wouldn't learn until a very long time later that Calvin Hoover had connections to people there in Sunderland. He visited Sunderland often, but police wouldn't know that right away. Once they found the body, police decided they needed to act fast. They needed to find the person who did this, not, you know, not now, but yesterday, which they rushed into it, which would then give a lot of issues to the investigation as well. So they basically split uh, this team into multiple teams of like detectives who would investigate certain leads. And again, later down the road, they would see a uh, they would have evidence in this box of someone being interviewed with regards to Calvin Hoover, but apparently the detectives who found or got the name Calvin Hoover investigated that realm were disregarded by the lead like inspectors on this case. Like these weren't good detectives who got that name. And so pff, that's nothing. They had suspects like these, like this kid in the neighborhood who was considered kind of like a weirdo but they ruled him out. There was like certain neighbors that appeared to be like, just kind of, you know, off, but ruled him out. On February 14th, 1985, detectives would go back to the Jessups, Bob and uh, Janet, and they asked them like, who would do this? Do you know anyone who would do this? They couldn't think of anyone. They couldn't think of any names at all. So the detectives kept pushing them like, do you have Anyone, 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 please give us the name of someone. They're like, we don't know who would do this. And there was so much pressure being put on the parents now at this point when Janet said something about one of their, their direct neighbor, a man named Guy Paul Moran. Janet had recalled that Guy Moran had never participated in any of the searches for Christine. He was this 25-year-old kid who always seemed to be nice enough, you know, and didn't really ever appear to be off or anything like that. Janet said to the police, yeah, I mean, I know that Guy, he plays the clarinet. He had honeybees in his house that he kept. And I don't know, he was kind of a weird guy at times, sometimes, not all the time. But then Janet and Bob would, would both say like, but for the most part, you know, the Morans were a really trustworthy family, as was Guy. I mean, yeah, he was a little weird, but he was a really kind person. I, we'd like, we don't think he would do this. Guy Paul Moran was considered this like handsome, smart, charismatic, very, very, very intelligent young man. You know, not the type of person you would ever really think would like kidnap a girl and murder her. But then again, you never really realize who the monsters are until they're they're revealed. On February 22nd, 1985, these detectives, who again are very inexperienced in investigating things like this, they go over to the Moran house and they start to talk to Guy Moran. They ask them, well, how do you, how well do you know Christine Jessup? And he's like, not that well. I mean, I'm 25, she's nine. Like, I don't really know her that well. He told them like, we didn't really interact much. We have a pretty large age difference. I had no reason to interact with her. You know, he said one time, I think I, we, you know, we were both outside and we were talking about gardening. That was about it. They asked him, where were you on the afternoon that Christine disappeared? And he said, I was at work. I work at a manufacturing facility. This was, I guess, 57 kilometers to the south of where everyone here lived. The detectives go to his work and they literally find his punch card and that he punched out at 3.32 p.m based on the distance from where his work is to where Christine would have been taken from, it would have taken, he would not have gotten home until at the very bare minimum least about 4.14 p.m. But at that time, Janet and Kenny had arrived home already at 4.10 and Christine was already gone. And if you remember, Christine didn't show up to that four o'clock, you know, play date she had with her friend Leslie. They then asked him, well, why didn't you help in the search for Christine? That's very unusual. The whole community was helping. And he said, quite honestly, the Jessops just never asked. They never asked me. And, you know, he and his dad had other work they were doing that they were behind on. And they were just trying to get that work done, I guess, for a job. And he said, at that point, the entire town was already involved in the search. So I just figured me and my dad can just keep doing this job while they're looking for Christine. No big deal. And it, it kind of makes sense, to be honest with you, but the detectives were like, no, this is fishy. This is very odd. Again, 
despite the fact that he could not have been there until at least 4.14 p.m., at least 15, 20 minutes after Christine had already probably vanished. Detectives would say, well, you know, we asked, we asked him, like, what did you think of Christine? Like, what, what would you describe her as? He said, she always seemed sweet and she always seemed innocent, a sweet, innocent little kid. I guess when he answered that question, the detectives didn't respond right away. So there was this like chunk of like quietness. And he just said, he said out loud, but then sometimes they grow up to be corrupt, which Guy Moran does not deny he said, but he didn't mean that like in any specific way. But the detectives were like, oh my God, that's motive. That's motive right there. What? They came up with this absolutely stupid concept that Guy Moran had predicted that this nine-year-old girl was going to become this corrupt, you know, woman who would just mess and toy with men and uh, that made him mad. And so he took her and killed her. What? Meanwhile, this other guy, Calvin Hoover, by the way, who police are still like not even remotely questioning or talking to or anything, he's playing the part. He actually helped in the search for the little girl. He went to the funeral. He consoled the family. You know, he was there. At that point, Guy Paul Moran became their guy. He was the suspect. He did it. In terms of physical evidence, there was male bodily fluids on or with Christine, but back in 1984, they did not have the DNA technology that we have now to test really against anyone, but they did collect it, thankfully, and they stored it properly, unbelievably. She was also wearing a necklace, and then that necklace was a strand of hair that police also collected and stored, but again, in 1984, they couldn't do much with. A few weeks into the now murder investigation, Guy Paul Moran is, I guess, at a jazz concert. Well, suddenly there was this these cosmetic people there one day. And this cosmetic person who I guess was helping them with their hair and makeup had asked everyone, hey, could we take a couple of plucks of all of your hair? Uh, which is just a strange way to approach this, but you know, Guy Paul Moran was like, sure, whatever. And so they plucked his hair. Well, it turns out the cosmetic people, at least one of them, was an undercover cop. And I guess when they left, they, they literally threw away all of the hair samples but Guy Paul Moran's. They took Guy's hair and they took, brought it to a, sci a forensic scientist who I guess had experience with criminal investigations in terms of like processing evidence like this. Again, in 1984, you couldn't, or 1985 at this point, you couldn't take DNA from a hair sample per se, not like we can now. So really, the only thing they could really do with a hair sample was look at it under a microscope and go, okay, they look the same, but a visual match is not a confirmed match that it's the same hair. The only thing they could do would be like, okay, this was like a black strand of hair found at the crime scene. Well, the hair sample we've gotten from a suspect is blonde. And so obviously that's not a match. The hair found on the necklace had been stored for roughly three months by the time they were doing all of this. And it wasn't stored great, and it had degraded over time, and the color of the hair had gotten lighter. And so this forensic scientist takes the, the hair sample from Guy Paul Moran and compares it to the hair sample found with Christine, and she said that it was a microscopic match, that it was consistent with one another. Something also to note that in this this police force, they, like I said earlier, they had broken into teams to like investigate certain areas and it became almost like a competition to see who could get there first, which would really be like, well, shouldn't, shouldn't we all be focusing on just the goal of solving this case and not like who can get there first anyway? But these two detectives who had this hair sample brought it to, you know, the head honcho and said, ah, look at that. We got him. This is the guy. The FBI also became, an, or an FBI profiler, I should say, became involved with like developing, helping these the police in Canada develop a profile. They said this will be a person between the ages of 19 and 26, is like a sloppy dresser. And so they would go on the news and they would announce this profile. But what they would do is they would conveniently leave out pieces of information from that profile that didn't fit Guy Paul Moran. And so when it was said on the news, you know, Guy was watching the news with his dad and his dad said, oh my God, that sounds like you. 
And so on April 22nd, 1985, when Guy Paul Moran was on his way to, I guess, a band practice, the police arrived and they arrested him. And well, he was like, what, what is this about? What am I arrested for? And they're like, you are under arrest for the kidnapping and the murder of Christine Jessup. And he's like, are you joking? Like, is this for real? What? Based on what? Guy Paul Moran would later recount that, you know, as he's in handcuffs, and he's walking into this police station. He sees the woman who actually took his hair from, you know, when they got the hair sample from him. He's like, oh, my God, like that was an undercover cop. And in, inside, he's like, Jesus Christ, she took my hair probably to match against something at the crime scene. Right. And that's why I'm under, the, under arrest. And he's like, I cannot believe I'm about to, to take the fall for something I didn't do. Guy Paul Moran had an airtight alibi. He was at work, he clocked out at work, and he could not have gotten home to that area in time to have kidnapped, murdered, and disposed of the body of the nine-year-old girl. It could not have happened. The detectives came up with this like, well, obviously Janet and Kenny got the time wrong when they got home. There's no, they didn't get home at 4, 10 p.m. They got home much later. That's, that's where the issue is. But Janet was like, are you fucking kidding? Like, I looked at the clock when I got home. It was 4, 10. They're like, no, it wasn't. You must have been mistaken. They actually said, well, your clock is running slow then. Your clock is broken. It's off. So, ugh. And they pressured her and they pressured her and they pressured her and they they like got so heavily into her mind that she got the time wrong that eventually she's like, okay, maybe I got home closer to 420, maybe 430. So Guy Paul Moran goes on trial with like the shittiest evidence. Like, I mean, they have this alibi, which is rock solid. Apparently the prosecution planned to use a cigarette butt that was found near the body as evidence to say, yep, see, more proof that Guy Paul Moran did it. That's how good we are. Then they found out that Guy Paul Moran was not a smoker, never smoked a day in his life. And so what happened to the cigarette butt that they found next to the body? Because they did find it. Oops, it's lost. It's, uh-oh. They also found mysterious red fibers on Christine's body. And lo and behold, Guy Paul Moran's car had, had red, I guess, upholstery in it. Later on, they would find out that the forensic technician who was analyzing the the fibers was literally wearing a red sweatshirt at the time with red fibers that would be identical to the red fibers found found with the body well what about what about Guy Paul Moraine's family where, what did they say where he was well they said he actually hadn't even gotten home until 5 30 p.m that day like he could not have gotten back to us at until about 4 14 p.m based on the distance and when he clocked out but we didn't actually see him until 5.30 p.m. This is because Guy Paul Moran had gone to the grocery store and to get gas. But police were like, oh, well, that's because the parents, his parents are protecting him and they are, uh, they're, they're part of this. Like, what are you guys going on about? So also they put an undercover officer in the jail cell with Guy Paul Moran before the trial. This undercover officer would claim that Guy Paul Moran confessed to the crime and even did this motion towards his own chest indicating that he had stabbed, you know, a girl, the, the girl in her chest. I guess Guy Paul Moran also used the, fr the, the phrase red rum to this under undercover officer. And later on, Guy Paul Moran would say, he, he said, he only said red rum to the officer in this jail cell because he couldn't think of the name of the movie where it came from, The Shining. But like they took everything he said and did and they just twisted it into fit a narrative because they needed this to be Guy Paul Moran. It had to be him no matter what. There was just too much strange, odd behavior with Guy. There were inconsistencies. There were these things he would say that just, er, and then you have the hair sample and these red fibers. Uh, it's gotta be him. It's gotta be him. It's him. And then it got to the point where the jury was, it was time for them to deliberate. They came back and they found Guy Paul Moran not guilty but there would be a second trial. This was because apparently there was a technical flaw that the judge gave to the jury in the first trial. And that's why a second trial was allowed to happen. By the time the second trial happened, police had lost some of the evidence. 
the the evidence that really never actually links to Guy Paul Moran really at all. Even some of their notes were missing. So this time the the prosecution or the, the crown, they had this new theory. They said Guy Paul Moran must have seen Christine holding this new recorder and then lured her into his car by playing his own like woodwind instrument, like a Pied Piper, they said. It was just asinine, but the he again he actually took the stand and said i'm in i didn't do this i'm innocent they're making all this shit up this is not i didn't kill her unbelievably by july 23rd 1992 at the end of this trial Guy paul moran is now found guilty later on a jury member would be interviewed and she said i just knew Guy was responsible because he never looked at us the jury so i knew he was guilty bitch what this is why normal everyday people, I'm sorry, shouldn't be on a jury ever. A jury should consist of people who are actually experts, who know these things, right? A jury of our peers? No, thank you. So at this point, Guy Paul Moran is 32 years old and he is sentenced to life in prison. By about 1995 or 1996, Guy Paul Moran was trying to appeal this case. And they found out that there was this breakthrough in DNA technology. And the prosecution was so sure of Guy Paul Moran's guilt that they said, yeah, let's test this DNA. It's got to be his. It'll prove our case. And he's like, yeah, well, let's do it. Test the DNA because they did find semen on her body, which they still had. So they test the DNA. They run it against Guy Paul Moran's DNA. It is a 100% not a match. Wasn't his. Three days after this revelation, he is completely released from prison. Every charge was dropped. Guy Paul Moran was now an innocent man. The man who had been dealing with this for basically a decade. But he knew that in the public's eye, because he had been found guilty, because this is how it always works, regardless of evidence, once a person's found guilty of a crime, the public is like, well, they're just guilty of it, so yeah. And so he knew he could never really be free until the actual killer was caught. It would not be until October of 2020 when police in Toronto, Toronto police took over the case, thankfully, they finally got a hit on who the DNA belonged to. It was a man who was 28 years old at the time of Christine's disappearance, a man named Calvin Hoover. Where was Calvin Hoover now? In 2020, he was dead. In 2015, Calvin Hoover ended his own life. Calvin Hoover had never been named or labeled a suspect at all. He was never interviewed, like I said earlier. The way they matched the DNA, by the way, was with the genealogical DNA, you know, with, with the genealogical websites. There would be no justice for Christine Jessup. No justice at all. What they believe happened is now that they have heard all of this information that they never really investigated before, that Calvin Hoover had overheard Janet talking about how essentially Christine was going to be alone at the house for a short period of time, that Calvin Hoover had driven to that area and Christine knew him. And so he probably said, hey, get in the car. And she probably said, oh, okay, Mr. Hoover, I'll do that. They also found out, you know, in 2020, that Calvin Hoover had friends who lived in Sunderland, really right by where the body was eventually found. He was a smoker. They found a cigarette next to the body, which has suddenly gone missing. They knew that the Hoovers and the Jessups were a close-knit group, and they interviewed Heather Hoover, but never interviewed Calvin for whatever reason. They never found out where he was at the time of the kidnapping and the murder. They never even looked into it. Therefore, it would be way too late to ever know what his whereabouts were. They also found in their records of the investigation that Calvin Hoover's name had been in their one of their notebooks, but was disregarded because the detectives working that lead were not good at their job. And obviously police back then were like, well, Calvin Hoover is at the funeral. I mean, he's here, he's crying, he's, he was there searching. We couldn't have done this. Of course not. Uh, the killer usually likes to interject themselves in the investigation and be around to see everything that's going on. So yeah, it's extremely possible. The hair found later on would be determined to belong to him as well. Physical evidence puts Calvin Hoover basically 
at her murder, at her crime scene, at, on her body. Calvin Hoover was her killer. Calvin Hoover kidnapped the little girl, but we'll never really know why he did it. We'll never really know how exactly he did it because he's dead, because he was never investigated. He was never looked at. He was never considered a suspect. He was never a person of interest. He was never anything. They didn't look at him. They just focused on this kid next door who people said may have been a little weird, but no physical evidence that could ever be confirmed put Guy Paul Moran at the site of the murder or on the body or anything. His alibi was airtight. There was just no physical way he could have done this, but he was still found guilty, but thankfully later exonerated. This was due to the shittiest police work I have, some of the shittiest police work I have seen. If they had really looked into Calvin Hoover, a person close to the family, who we all know, typically this happens by people who are known to the victim. If they had done their due diligence, they had looked into him, maybe they would taken his hair samples. If they'd done all of that, Calvin Hoover may have been the one arrested and in a jail cell, and maybe Christine Jessup would have gotten justice, but they didn't do anything with Calvin Hoover. They wanted it to be Guy Paul Moran, and that was it. That was it. And they were confident in it too. You, you drug this innocent man through the legal system. You ruined his life. I mean, from now on, people are gonna look at him as the guy who was at one point convicted of kidnapping and sexually assaulting and murdering a nine-year-old child. Despite this DNA clearing him, you still have that cloud over him the rest of his life because people are always going to be people and they're always gonna go, well, he was convicted, so maybe he did have something to do with it. Despite the physical evidence, it's just, that's just the nature of things. But it's frustrating. It's, I hate, I hate these types of, of situations. It's so aggravating. We, we trust these authorities to, to do the work, find the right person. But this happens so often, not just here in the States. Obviously it happens in Canada, like with this case. But at least Guy Paul Moran is a free man, um, as loosely as we can say that. Calvin Hoover ended his own life, never taking accountability for what he did to that nine-year-old child. And sadly, Christine Jessup, this innocent, sweet nine-year-old kid, did not get the justice she very rightfully deserved. And sadly, that is it for this case. True crime, Aruni Duty Dingleberry Dongs. I hope you found it interesting. Um, as usual, please subscribe to this channel if you like true crime. Three stories a week here on YouTube. Follow me over on TikTok. The link is below. It comes up here at some point at the end. And uh, check out the merch store, recommend a case to my email, and that's it. That's it for this video. So, yeah. Until the next case, true crime, roony dony dony dangle berry dongs. Was that Southern mixed with like British Australian? What was that? Until next time, true crime, roony dony dangle berry dongle dingle dongles. Until, until the next video. What am I doing, Mike? I don't even know. I like chicken. What about you? Well, this is awkward. So, uh, there's a word. There's a word you say when you're done in a situation like this, when it's time to leave. There's a word, I just, I can't think of it. So instead I said I like chicken, which is true by the way, I do. And turkey. I'm a meat-eating meat 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 person, meat-eating, meater, meater per I'm a meat, I like meat. Gross. Um, well, shish kebabs on a chicken strip, turkey, meatball. And the dogs are snoring in the background and I don't know what I'm doing. <laughs> Anyway, okay, awkward.